Did you know that the episode you are about to listen to is available on YouTube as a full multi-camera experience? Search for the Murder Police podcast channel on YouTube. Subscribe and see what you have been missing. Any friend of mine or anybody that I come in contact with that I even see the hints of this stuff. I'm, and I mean, I'm the first one to say, look, let me tell you where my sister is. She's five minutes down the road, six feet under. Don't be like her. Don't be like her. Get out. Warning. The podcast you're about to listen to may contain graphic descriptions of violent assaults, murder, and adult language. Listener discretion is advised. Welcome to the Murder Police Podcast, The Murder of Lydia Cassidy, Part 4. Cassie kept asking me from the coroner's office, she kept asking me, you know, Carolyn, you know anything about the the fingers and her ring fingers and things like that? And I kept going, no, what do you mean? And she's like, well, her fingers were broken. And so, of course, you know, again, myself, my sister, my niece, we're all true crime junkies, like Dateline, ID, all, and for years and still. And, uh, you know, I just said to her, I don't know, you know, I said, I don't know. I mean, maybe it's something twisted about the fact that she wouldn't marry him. So maybe he broke her fingers. Her fingers. Yeah. You know, I don't know. And so what ended up coming out of the autopsy when Michael called, you know, Michael called, he's such a, again, can't say enough about that group. But when he called me, he was like, you know, Carolyn, are you, you know, because he asked, he said, well, we'll find out kind of everything at this autopsy. You know, it's up to you whether you want to know all of yes. that or I said, absolutely. I want to know. E- I want to know everything as much as you can tell me. And so, you know, I think that night um, their bedroom, it was pretty small. And and the reason it was so small is they had a huge king size bed in that room with two big dressers. And so really from the door to the side of the bed, there was just this little walkway kind of thing, like almost like just a straight path from the door to the wall because, and, and pretty much you almost had to get in on this one side. There was very little space on this other side. And so what we think happened to her based on what the coroner says and, and kind of where it's at is, um, he walked into that room and at point blank range, he shot her in the head and she did know it was coming. She was facing him and she was protecting him. And that's what caused the broken fingers and um, her ring to be dismantled. And so basically she had her hands like this when he shot her in the head. And so he, he had one, he did one shot into her head, which killed her according to them. Um, She then fell on the ground, um, fell down, fell on her glasses, uh, fell down on the ground. And then he administered a kill shot in the back of her head. Wow. And then he just left her and there. And then left. Yeah. And, you know, you know, again, we watch a lot of true crime. So, you know, when you're, so again, when all of this happened, you know, we're having to go to the police station and, you know, this was an active crime scene. So it's like, okay, like we have two children that have all their stuff there. Exactly. Like, exactly. what do you do with that? And so once they cleared the crime scene, which wasn't too long, it was probably a day We were able to come back the next day and they had given us approval to, they'd given us approval to go there with, I think, I can't remember if an officer, I don't think an officer went with it, given us approval to go get the basics. Sure. And then they said, well, as soon as we clear this and that, we'll let you come back and get whatever you need. And so again, you know, when you're walking in, you know, I just had this my true crime mind, you know, Hey, there's splatter everywhere, or, you know, stuff like that. And, and there wasn't, I mean, it was, you know, almost like a um, flip chart size piece of paper, just saturated of blood on the floor on the carpet. Um, Lydia was also, she was on blood thinners because of her oh. heart valve. So, I mean, there was a lot of blood, sure. but it, you know, again, it was just kind of confined, one, to, confined one to one kind of space, which, you hate to say that that's a good thing, but it was, you know, it's awful. Yes. But, you know, I had this vision of, oh, my gosh, this it's is going to be, be awful. Yeah. yeah. And so, I mean, it was horrid. 
don't get me wrong, but it just wasn't what I was. Yeah, picturing. I think you build yourself up yep. to expect because you see it on the shows, like you say, and you yep. build yourself up that it's going to be yep. horrendous. And when it's not, you're kind of relieved, but it still is horrendous. But yep. at least you expected the worst. And you have and that the, curiosity that comes way too close to home. Yeah, that's the sad thing that yep. went through with Wendy mm-hmm. and Angie is that uh, it it should never be that way. Yep, it should never be that way. Well, and you know, and again. She, well, where she died or whatever, you know, you were just like, okay, you know, when you walk in, you're just thinking, and and I'd asked, of course, you know, asked, you know, what was she wearing, like mm-hmm. all the things, you know, and she still had, she, well, she had on. Now, again, they had gone to get the car, the vehicle mm-hmm. from the shop. And so she still had on, though, like, again, the the timeline for her death was between seven and like 10, 10 or midnight. And so, but she had her tennis shoes still on. She had her jacket on like, and the clothes that she had on, um, were like really frumpy looking clothes, like almost like bedtime kind of like, I'm yeah. going to get, I'm like in my laid back kind of yeah. clothes. Um, and all I kept thinking was like, she was ready to walk that day. I mean, cause again, for her, even at like eight o'clock, like she was starting to get, I mean, cause she got up really early in the mornings. So I'm like, this argument never stopped yeah. until he shot her. Like, you know, wow. so, you know, I think, I think at that point she was ready to go. She wanted to leave. And maybe even was trying to leave. Yeah. And I think even to the point that the kids were like, dad, just let us leave. Like you can still be part of our life. Like you got everybody now saying, just let us go, yes. right? Just let us go. And he wasn't going to let it go. No, because no. even though he had someone else, maybe a few someone else's, yep. they still want that control yep. of that little bit. They well, don't want to give Wendy that up. That in my opinion is, because uh, you had asked one time in Angie's, did, do they plan this? And uh, I said this before we started. And I really believe that they don't plan the hour of the day, but it, the capacity is there that, that yeah. even though they won't vocalize it to people, that taking the life of that person is a very real thing. And yeah. so the, mentally, I think they've rehearsed it. It's just when the moment hits, that's yeah. why they're so ready to do it. and Because they yeah. they've thought about it before. No, that's it. And it yeah. becomes just like uh, we're talking about uh, making a rational decision to leave. For them, the rational decision is to, is is to, to just kill. kill. And you have to wonder if in the back of his mind that whole time when he's headed to Florida or when he leaves out the door after he kills her, does he think he's going to kill himself? Does he know that's his end game? I think that that's another. And I wonder that part. it's either suicide by cop, mm-hmm. which is what they were probably talking about. Yeah. And then I, th- I think, and just like with Anton, same thing is that that's the next step mm-hmm. in that is that uh, there's that for all that, um, oh, for all that uh, macho in that mm-hmm. is they're extremely coward. Yeah. And, and, uh, and they're not going to go and yep. sit in a prison over that. It, uh, I still remember. And that's what my husband kept saying was there, there we coward. go. And I think yes. Daryl called him right too. And yep. it was we, what snuck up on me when we started doing a podcast a couple of years ago is that uh, it made me reflect back on the cases that I'd worked when I did this, that you don't think about them in the context of what they are while you're doing mm-hmm. them. And then I stepped back and I'm like, Holy shit, we had way too many domestic violence cases. Yeah. And but when you're knee deep in them, it, it, it's actually not as material. But I remember having one where uh, a guy was breaking up with a younger girl. She worked mm-hmm. at a Chevrolet, uh, I think it was a Chevrolet distributor up on Richmond Road in Lexington. Yeah. Middle of the afternoon and shoots her to death right there at the service counter. Uh, Kevin Kelly, a very good friend of mine, was the first one there. And the guy slid the gun to him and, and gave up. And we go and he has a tape in his house and he's videotapes himself smoking a cigarette. And he's saying, well, if you're watching this, I've already killed myself and I'm very happy with what I did. Well, he chickened out at the very last yeah. night when Kevin got there and then slid the gun. But it's like they all of that. I guess what I'm getting at is that it's more than capacity. It's planning. Yes. But the exact time is, yeah. is what we And then you have to, to wonder, like, if that person who did that, if he's out of jail now. And I think the only and I'm sure for you. Yeah. Because it's for me, and this is only my personal feeling, I'm so glad that it ended with him the way it did, because how horrible would it have been if in 10 years, 15, 12 years, seven years, he's out. And And then you don't have your person back and they're out. 
yeah. knowing what they did. That's, that's a whole nother rabbit Level. hole that is yeah. disgusting. Yes. Is that, yeah. uh, the, that's the re-victimization of the, yes. the victims. Of the family. Yeah. Speaking of that, moving forward, mm-hmm. uh, what have you done uh, to metabolize this? Do Are you active in do- domestic violence prevention or any yeah, groups? Tell us what you do. We've, um, uh, you know, Cassie and I uh, visited one of the domestic violence um forms that they did here in Jesmond County, right? A little while after Lydia had passed. Um, and we also, our family kind of started, um, it's called beehivestrong.com. Uh, and it's a website where the kids have, um, you know, my niece makes some, uh, little rings, uh, with some jewels on them, some little stones, um, and there's some swag items, you yeah. know, with that and just really just to honor her and also to talk about domestic violence. So anyone that orders anything from there, we send them a whole domestic violence information and kind of kit. We've also partnered with Greenhouse 17 on that initiative. So everything we sell, 25 percent of that goes back to them. Um, and then we've just been really trying to be active with some of the Greenhouse 17. In fact, we're uh, hoping to get out there in the next couple of weeks. We had a young lady who's donated a quilt. We had another lady out of Boston who has made all of these makeup zip bags, little handbags, stuff that you can throw stuff in uh, for the ladies that come to the um, the shelter as well. Why don't you tell what Greenhouse, because we know, Yes. why don't you tell our listeners and, and Darlene Thomas runs it, and she's just wonderful she anyway. Is also Why don't you tell years. what Greenhouse 17 is? Because I know when I first heard it, I thought it's a greenhouse. They must grow things there. <laughs> and why 17? Yeah. So tell what that is. I probably can't do it as good of justice as obviously Darlene can, but they're domestic violence shelter uh, out of Lexington, and they help women get on their feet. Um, they provide housing. They provide, even if you don't need housing, they'll provide a active list of resources, necessities that you need. Uh, They'll work with you with safety plans, which I think, you know, if you're in a situation like my sister was at the time before she was killed, um, the safety plan of how to how to exit. Yeah. Right. Safely. Safely. Um, And I think that's key. I I I just think it's huge. Um, But that organization just does so much. They do have greenhouses on the property. I think that's why they have the name. Um, And I I think one of the greatest things, too, is it's just not a handout. It's a hand up that they give. So when women come and live on the on the property, um, they actually have jobs. You know, they grow their own things. They sell their own stuff on their website. Uh, they make soaps. I mean, just all kinds of things that they do there to kind of make up mm-hmm. and make money to give back, you know, and to provide for. The well, and it probably gives them a sense of. I'm doing something. Yeah. Well, you and know, safety I'm helping. Too, yes. Because when we say property, this nobody really knows where Greenhouse 17 That's is. That's right. Is that even as a police officer, you'll go to your grave with where that location yep. is. It's not shared with anybody. Yeah. So that when you take somebody there, yep. you can assure them that nobody is going to get to yep. you there. And they have really hard rules for Well, and it's secured. And, yeah, exactly. yeah. I mean, it's more like a prison, not a prison, yeah. but it, the way it's set up exactly. is to keep people out yeah. right because sure. sometimes these women i can imagine probably get in there and then they get feeling a little remorseful of maybe i shouldn't have done this or maybe Absolutely. he really didn't mean it like that and then you don't want them call and saying okay i'll leave and we'll be together again because lord knows he he or he's talking it up or whoever their abuser is you, you're, you're coming right back to that whole difficult part about that is yeah. the psychological breakdown yes. that happens on that in the codependencies and the different types you know we had uh uh, uh, Jai Hamilton with Animal Control mm-hmm. just come in and talk about the 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 use of pets as bargaining to empower mm-hmm. tools in domestic violence. And yeah. Kentucky finally has an EPO section yep. where you can a judge can order a mm-hmm. pet in. Well, and I think one of the things recently, if I'm correct, that I've I've, I've uh, seen on greenhouses, they've given the greenhouse 17 a certain amount of those individuals. They've given them the authority to issue out EPOs now. That is so super yeah, that's a handful really of great. those that have been kind of deputized, if you sure, will, or, sure. or gone through that process to be able to issue those, I to, believe. To get over the barrier of time. That's right. You know, because and because time is of the essence. Because courts are not 24-7. Yep. And, mm-hmm. 
you know, to be able to get down and get a a, a worker and yep. see somebody at a window to swear to the affidavit is a, is a big pain. And yep. and then judges aren't on all the clock. I yep. used to go to judges' houses at three thirty and five in the morning. Well, and, and we were in the same situation. We had to get an EPO against him when he was on the run, and uh, so I mean, it took us uh, a while. You know, yep. and again, Scott County guys were great, but it it did, does take a lot of time. I mean, no, absolutely. So. Just for clarity, Beehive Strong. Yep. B E H I V. It's no, B-E. it's just B. It's just, just like just the bubble B. B. Okay. Well, it's just B. 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 Oh, B. The letter B. Hive. H I V E. Strong. Dot com. I'm glad I cleared. I should have brought down the bumblebee <laughs> well, and shirt brought, we I got because I have it upstairs. Too, we'll, so. we'll, put, we'll splash on the screen for the YouTube yep. version. Yes. But, and then we'll, but I just want to direct people to yep. to go and support that. Through that yes, too. there's shirts, there's hats, yeah, all there's kinds little of swag. Yep. bumblebees that are yep. crocheted. Like I said, uh, Jasper had gotten one we came when we came to your house. He wanted one. Yep. Um, so yes, yeah, support that organization. Oh, for sure. As well as Greenhouse 17, they're and, both and wonderful. Since we, we're listening to internationally, and it, probably most regions have something similar to Greenhouse 17, yeah. probably not as many as we'd like. And again, you know, uh, the, if you're really in a, in a pinch with this or you're concerned or you're concerned about a friend, is it? I'm going to give the number out one more time. Yeah, that. yeah, uh, I, 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 I will do that if yeah, you'd like, do. sir. Um, know that you are not alone. You don't have to be a victim. And it's scary to leave. I can't imagine what Lydia and Angie went through. But find your strength for yourself or your loved ones and get out. Uh, If you're a victim of domestic violence or partner violence, reach out to your local police department uh, or the National Domestic Hotline, 1-800-799-7233. Keep yourself safe. Um, be your own advocate. Yeah. And I would say, I would say just another, just to add to that is as a family member, look for the signs. Yes. I mean, the signs are, I mean, it's, it's, it's really crazy when you look at the signs of when a domestic violence situation is happening, the partner will take them away from the core support yes. that they have. So they'll remove any friends, family, because they want to relieve those barriers. So the control factor will happen. You won't have those friends that you always had. You won't be able to go see that family like you always were able to see that yes. family. Um, they will start to determine what you're spending, when you're spending, where you're going, what you're doing. They'll want to know where you're at every moment of the day. You know, if those things are happening to you, please, Please seek help because yes, and and even down to the phone. You know, I know at first with Angie, when I started seeing the sign, what really stuck out to me was I tried to call her on our morning route, like you did, Lydia, and the phone kept going to voicemail, and then it would text, and I texted her and said, "Why aren't you taking my call? Are you okay?" And I I think I had that kind of panic because we always talked in the morning. And it came on automated thing that said, um, this person has activated uh, the do not disturb feature mm-hmm. while they're while they're in driving, motion driving. Whatever, yeah. And I was like, what? Maybe something's wrong with her phone. So then I knew she'd be at work at a particular time. So I called and I said, what's wrong with your phone? And she's like, oh, nothing. He just wants to keep me safe while I'm driving. And he told me that it's best to not text and drive or talk and drive. So I deactivate my phone while I'm driving so nobody can disturb me because he wants to keep me safe. Girl, this guy loves me. And I said, no, you are a grown woman and you know how to talk. And I mean, I'm not advocating texting and driving, but it wasn't like she's 16 and we're not going to be safe. Right. And I said, well, why didn't you take my call? Well, he likes to talk to me in the mornings because, girl, you know, I'm the first thing on his mind as soon as we wake up. And and I was like, he's taking our morning time and he don't want her texting because then it's nobody can contact her. So you're right. right. When those little signs come up. Well, and if you're having, you know, I mean, you as an individual, if you're in a situation and you're having to delete your text yes, messages because that's you don't not, want your, that's not normal. No, that's not okay. They're not doing it because they're keeping you safe or they love you. Yeah. Don't believe those lies. It's yeah. all a method of control. That's right. All down to who you're talking to. Uh, you know, you had said that how they want to take things away from you. Uh, the spending, you know, yeah. she wasn't allowed to go to the gym with me no more. He put, he, he put gym equipment in so she didn't have to go out. Yep. 
Well, and I mean, you know, anything that, I mean, there was nothing in her name because nothing would be in her name because she had no control. She had nothing. I mean, you know, and again, when you're in a relationship and your person's telling you what you're going to spend, when you're going to spend it, how you're going to spend it, when you're making your own money and everything. I mean, it's one thing to have a budget and you're working as yes. a team and and obviously would highly recommend that. But it's different when you're saying you don't have any money, you can't spend any money, I can't go there because Ken's not giving me money. Um, we don't have money for that. Well, what do you mean you don't have money for that? He just bought a you know, $500 gumball machine at the antique store, you know, you do have money. Like, yes. you know, so I mean, he's controlling that's every right. bit of it. I think anytime you're in those situations where they're controlling who you're talking to, how often you're talking to your circle, just remember your circle. That was your circle before you met that yes. person. And if they're not still your circle, there's a problem. Yes. There's a problem. And so especially. Well said. So well said. Yes. So please, if you are a victim of domestic or partner violence, please reach out to your local police department or your national domestic violence hotline. Again, that is 1-800-799-7233. You are not alone. I promise you there's resources out there. You can do this. Absolutely. Carolyn, thank you. Oh, thank you thank for having you. me. I'm very blessed yeah. to be here. And no, we're, we're blessed to have you to talk. It. And again, so articulately. Yes. And everything, uh, yeah, very such a well. picture of Lydia mm-hmm. and uh, and probably we're going to help a lot of people by letting them see the nuances of what. This yes. And also like. because like you had mentioned before, we've done many domestic violence episodes on our show. You just don't think it can happen to you. You think that's somebody else. Right. That's never going to happen to my person. Yeah. Well, and I, and if, you know, again, I think my husband will probably tell you differently. I, I mean, even though I knew he was a bad guy, like I just knew, I knew in my heart, like, you got to get out of this. You got to get out of this. You know, I just, I never thought he would shoot her twice. Yes. Right there in the head. I, that was just not something that my mind could rationalize and, but it will. Yes. And And that's what I tell, you know, any friend of mine or anybody that I come in contact with that I even see the hints of this stuff. I'm, and I mean, I'm the first one to say, look, let me tell you where my sister is. She's five minutes down the road, six feet under. Yes. Now don't be like her. Get out. Yes. Get out. Like it's not, it's not worth any of that. No. Get out safely. Get out safely. Yes. And if your gut is talking to you, you're right. You better listen to it. You better listen. Well, thank you so much, Carolyn, for for taking the time to come share Lydia's story with us. And thank you so much. I know you wouldn't have it any other way, but for raising her children. um, I I, I know that they're so lucky to have you and your husband. And um, so thank you so much for coming. I appreciate being here. Thank you. If you are a victim of domestic violence or partner violence, please call your local police department or the National Domestic Violence Hotline at 1-800-799-7233. You are not alone. There are resources available to help you and your family. The Murder Police Podcast is hosted by Wendy and David Lyons and was created to honor the lives of crime victims, so their names are never forgotten. It is produced, recorded, and edited by David Lyons. The Murder Police podcast can be found on your favorite Apple or Android podcast platform, as well as at murderpolicepodcast.com, where you will find show notes, transcripts, information about our presenters, and a link to the official Murder Police podcast merch store, where you can purchase a huge variety of Murder Police podcast swag. We are also on Facebook, Instagram, and YouTube which is closed caption for those that are hearing impaired. Just search for the Murder Police Podcast and you will find us. If you have enjoyed this podcast, please subscribe for more and give us five stars and a written review on Apple Podcasts or wherever you download your podcasts. Make sure you set your player to automatically download new episodes so you get the new ones as soon as they drop. And please tell your friends. Lock it down, Judy.